Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 91, which reads as follows. Uyunjanti satimanto nanikete ramantite hangsawa palalang hitwa okamogang jahantite which means Uyunjanti Satimanto, the mindful exert themselves, or the mindful work hard. Nanikete Ramantite, they don't delight in dwellings, or uh, they don't delight in dwellings, in homes. Hangsawa Palalang Hitwa, just as a, or like a swan having. Uh, abandon the lake, abandon the lake. O kamo kang jahanti te. They abandon house after house, home after home. So this story, uh, this verse, was told in relation to a story that's actually interesting in relation to the verse, um, because it actually implies something of the opposite, what you would think. From the sounds of this verse, you would think that the Buddha was saying that a person who is mindful exerts themselves, such a person should, uh, we would most likely expect, to avoid having a home and wander. No? So here we have this story. Uh, the Buddha was going on pilgrimage, uh, wandering, charika. It would be the Buddha would go around India to teach, um, so traveling from place to place and living and 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 talking with people, debating sometimes with people, with other ascetics. Sometimes lay people would come and debate with him or ask him difficult questions, and he would teach and answer and and spread his teachings throughout India. So he was getting ready to go, and all the monks knew that the Buddha was getting ready to go, and so they all prepared, packed up their things, um, they scrubbed out their their bowls and gathered up their robes, and then they saw Mahakasapa, who was washing his robe, and they started snickering to themselves or or you know frowning, turning up their noses at this. Because this is a clear indication that Mahakasapa wasn't ready to go, and he wasn't going. And they said, oh, I know. One of them said, I know what's going on here. Here's a guy who is attached to houses. He's attached to, the, to his dwelling. I mean, who wouldn't be? He's famous, and he's loved by all the lay people, and they give him the best choicest of food and robes and everything he wants. He gets here. If I, if I got that, I wouldn't leave either. So no doubt he's staying here because he's attached to it and he's comfortable with it. Right? And so they gossiped and, and were rather fairly mean-spirited, it sounds like. Maybe not mean-spirited, but they certainly misrepresented his intention because the Buddha heard about it. Well, what happened then, they, they all, they, they, everyone left. All the monks left. And Mahakasapa went with them, but he got to a certain point, and the Buddha turned and said to Mahakasapa, Mahakasapa, you stay behind. And they had the monks said, nodded and said to themselves, said to each other, now there you go, even the Buddha knows that Mahakasapa can't leave this place, he's too attached to it. And so when they were sitting down, I guess in the evening, or they were talking amongst themselves when they were walking, maybe the Buddha turned and said, what are you guys talking about? What are you bhikkhus engaged in discussion about? And they told him, and he said, that's ridiculous, that's not, that's not at all, well, he didn't use those words, but he said, that's not at all why Mahakasapa was not ready to go, and that's not at all why I, I asked him to turn around. Because Mahakasapa made, he said, made a, a determination in his 
in his past lives to be a support for lay people. And so he gives a long story about when he made this determination, but for our purposes it's not really useful. The point is he had this intention to stay and be of benefit to people. If all the monks left, then who would stay to teach and who would stay to care for and, and, and uh, encourage and really support the meditators and the practitioners in the area? So Mahakasaba knew that it was his. He, he and the Buddha were actually very close. And when the Buddha passed away, Mahakasaba was sort of looked upon as the leader um, of sorts, though not to take the place of the Buddha, but uh, to to take over some of the role of of guidance and and of direction. So when the Buddha left to go on on his his tour, uh, Mahakasaba was he knew he it was best for him to stay behind because otherwise. There would be many things that, that left undone and many people looking to learn about the Dhamma who wouldn't get to hear it and so on. And the Buddha said, this is, and he told this long story about, well, he told a story anyway about Mahakasapa making this wish to be of benefit to people and to not go out of his way. And then the Buddha said that he pointed out using this verse, he actually pointed out that um, it's not that uh, it's, it's not that people who are mindful, who are enlightened, and uh, like an arahant, um, it's not that they are the ones, or they are not the ones who need to leave houses. Right? They will need to leave their dwellings, need to be careful, because they have no attachment. A person who has no attachment has no problem staying behind. It's the exact person that you want to have stay in one place and... Um, teach and to spread the, the teachings so it kind of put the other monks in the place because the implication is well you guys have to come with me so I can take care of you and so you can you know, not be attached to to one place for too long and so in Thailand you get this a lot uh, monks will wander and never spend more than one night or never spend more than one week in one place I've talked to monks who spent the whole year outside of the rains they wouldn't spend two nights in a row in the same in the same uh, spot, so they would constantly be moving. It's harder to do now. But there are monks who do this. I'm not convinced that it's the greatest thing to do, but there's a sense that well, when you're still um, when you're still attached to dwellings, that can be quite useful it's to keep you on your toes. So this is our story <coughs> and the verse which is fairly clear, but let's just go through it. So, satimanto udyunjanti, that the the mindful are not lazy, is basically what's being said here, because there was an implication that Mahakasaba was lazy. He just couldn't be bothered to go on a tour. Why bother when everything is so comfortable here? The Buddha pointed out that even when, mind, even when mindful people stay in one spot, uh, you can't call them lazy. They will, they will never get lazy because they're mindful person who stays put, even a person who does nothing but walk and sit all day, shouldn't be considered lazy. Their, their mindfulness keeps them alert, keeps them energetic, keeps them from being lazy. So it's not necessarily the case that just because you stay in one place, you're not going to be energetic. And the mindful are always energetic, never lazy. So those of you who feel like you're lazy out there, use mindfulness. You don't have to go running or you don't have to exert yourself, just be mindful. When you're mindful, you can be sitting still all day and still be considered energetic. Your mind will be alert and you won't fall into the trap of being lazy. Nanike te ramanti te. They don't have love for dwellings. So it's not that they leave them behind, that they... Uh, that they... they, they um, have to escape them, but that they have no love for them. And they will leave, and they're happy to go when it's time to go. So the second part says, like a swan leaves behind a lake. The swan doesn't worry about the lake. The swan is not concerned with the lake or say, oh, that was a nice place, maybe I should stay. Swans, when they leave, they leave. I mean, swans are just dumb animals, but in the same vein, the swan not worrying about the lake or not not loving the lake or falling in love with the lake or being attached to it. The swan goes and knows when it's time to go. 
In the same way, uh, wise people or those who are mindful, they leave behind or they abandon house after house. So basically saying, Mahakasapa has no problem leaving. He certainly is not attached. To, I mean, Mahakasapa was one of the greatest of the Buddha's disciples. There's some traditions that say he's still alive, waiting to give his robe to the next Buddha. He's, he, 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 he entombed himself in the mountain and uh, went into a trance, and he's going to stay there for whatever, thousands or hundreds of thousands of years uh, before Maitreya comes. And when Maitreya comes, he's going to come out and give him his robe. There's a, I think it's a Mahayana tradition that says, or it's maybe just an Indian folklore or something. But he's highly revered uh, as... He was apparently the tradition is I think that he he aspired once to be a Buddha, but when he met our Buddha, he he realized oh how difficult it would be and how much better he, off he would be to learn from this Buddha. So he put aside his intention. Or maybe that was Mahakachayana, I think that's a different monk. I'm confusing them. But no, Mahakasapa was the head of the sangha after the Buddha passed away, or the father of the sangha is often called after the Buddha passed away. It's not exactly accurate, but that's sort of how he's looked upon. So he was a, a great figure in the Sangha and certainly had no attachments. But there's a couple of lessons we can learn here. The first is not to criticize people. Really not at all. You know, Criticizing others rarely does any good. It usually just feeds your ego um, and helps assuage any uh, any insecurities we have. You know, you feel better bringing other people down a notch. Not good. Um, and it's often misguided. You know, people do things for reasons that, if we thought about it, we might be able to empathize and understand why they're doing things. You know, the person who you're very angry at because of, at because of the evil things they've done. Well. Who knows why they're doing them? Probably they have evil inside of them. But they may be doing it because they feel hurt or because they're in a position where they're not able to understand what's wrong with what they're doing or this kind of thing. And often they're doing it blamelessly. You know, and we get to constantly at Jan Tong people would criticize him and about the silliest of things. Um, there was one monk who came and saw that Ajahn Tong had all this wonderful food because people, they adore him. So the food that they would give him is special, extra special food. And there was this one Western guy who ordained as a monk for a short time and he just was disgusted by it. He said, what's he doing eating all that good food when we here we have to... I mean, I think it came from the fact that he wanted some of the good food, but he just felt it was it was wrong and unfair. People criticize things. Like there's this story of this Zen story of these Western men, I guess, who became became monks, and they went to live with this Japanese monk. I think Japanese monk, Chinese monk maybe, and probably Chinese. And they were in the monastery, and every day, the uh, or maybe it was just one man. Anyway, in, in the monastery, every day the monk would bow down to this Buddha statue. And so the guy started doing it, and then every day he saw, every day we had to do bowing and bowing and bowing to this Buddha statue. And finally the guy got, ups got upset about it, and he turns to him and he said, Look, this is ridiculous. I don't want to bow down to this dumb statue. And he said, I sp I'd rather spit on that image than bow down to it. And the Chinese monk turns to him and says, Okay, you spit, I'll bow. <laughs> We sometimes we hold on to things quite strongly, and we miss the fact that it's not wrong what the other person, what other people are doing. You know, they have reasons for it, and we have to ask ourselves. This is what I learned a lot in Thailand, because I was that sort of way in Thailand, criticizing this, criticizing that. Um, but then I watched, and I saw, especially Ajahn Tong, how uncritical he is, and how accepting, and how he just doesn't even comment on so many things. And and then he when he does comment, he finds the good in it. He finds a way to focus people's attention on what's good about it. 
and to point out that, sure, he'll say sometimes like, you know, some people say this is just a ritual, but you know, it makes people feel good, it makes people mindful, it makes people think about the Buddha, etc., etc. And that really opened my eyes to, yeah, that's it. I mean, we're the ones with the unwholesome mind. This guy was, this guy who was obsessed with spitting. Well, he was the one obsessed with the bowing. He was the one that got upset about it. That's the first thing we can learn is to not criticize others without knowing their reasons. You know? Be careful. We should always worry more about our own faults. Not pare sang wilo mani, not pare sang katagatang. We shouldn't worry about the faults of others or the things they've done or left undone. Uh, the second thing is this point that I've sort of already made that but it's a two-pronged point. There's the idea that people who are truly mindful don't need to um, don't need to do any special practice. And that's very much true. You know, a mindful person, there's there is this Zen thing about the Buddha riding a, in a Ferrari and wearing gold rings and so on um, because he wasn't attached to it. And so this kind of thing you know, it's it's possible to go f way too far with this idea. Because you say, well, okay, so a mindful person doesn't have to do any special practice. A mindful person doesn't attach to things. Well, then they could have sex, and they could drink alcohol, and they could have, do drugs and all these sorts of things. It wouldn't hurt them. But the point is that the mindful person wouldn't do these things. I mean, it's not to say that it couldn't happen. You can be raped or that kind of thing, but... Uh, and you can drink something thinking it's not alcohol and, and what, what wind up being alcohol or drugs or so on. I once uh, I was once given these this these pills by this woman. I don't know what her deal was, but I don't I don't really think she had bad intentions. But she gave me these pills saying it was like ginseng. I thought, well, ginseng that's good for your mind, but. When I looked it up on the internet, I was I, I took the pill and I swallowed it. She gave me this bottle and she said, "It'd be good for you as a monk." <laughs> and so I took the pill, I swallowed it, and as it was settling in my stomach, I I uh, I was look I looked on the internet um, to see what its uh, characteristics were, and it was an aphrodisiac. <laughs> like oh well, there it is. I guess that's the only one I'll be eating of that. Um, but it's true that you, you know it, it, if you don't have the the desires, then it shouldn't affect you. You know it shouldn't be a problem. But people use it as an excuse to do things that they want to do and claim that they're not attached. Yeah, I enjoy it, but I'm not attached to it. Right? It's a huge exercise in delusion and self-delusion that somehow you can. Uh, be angry and not cling to it, or be greedy and not cling to it. It's certainly not the case. These, um, the, anything that's mental, any of your ju mental judgments, that's what the prob where the problem lies. Anything that makes you afraid or worried or bored or sad, angry or uh, uh, greed or anger in its very base forms, they are in and of themselves a problem. So. Um, you shouldn't use this as an excuse to stay put. In fact, often uh, Mahakasapa may have stayed where he was, but he, in the end, went and lived up on the on the on the hill, on the mountain above uh, Rajagaha. I think after the Buddha passed away, yeah, that's where he was staying, because that's where they did the the first council, and they invited him down. They wanted him to come and stay in the city because he was the big monk and he was getting old. And they said, you know, we need you down here to stay, support us. And he refused. Every day he would go back up, walk all the way up. It's quite a walk. Every day he would walk up and, and live up on the mountain. Apparently he never, li never laid down either. He would always walking and sitting, never lying down throughout his life or his later years anyway but I think throughout his monastic life. So yeah, don't take... Um, so it's not like he was 
just living in the lap of luxury and and not clinging to it. He was, and he and they asked him why, and he said it was it was out of compassion for others, so that they were able to see the good example, and because it's much more peaceful. It's just a, the right thing to do: living in the forest, living alone, living at peace. There's no sense of that. But one should not be attached to these things, nor criticize someone. I mean, a lot of criticism, there was this big criticism that went around recently about these monks who had a, had their own private jet and wore sunglasses. And at first I, I understood that that was the criticism, and it didn't really phase me at all. I'm like, okay, well, it's possible that the mon monastery could have a jet for, you know, it's a bit outrageous, but... My point being, those things in and of themselves don't necessarily, because they're tools. You know, even sunglasses, lots of monks wear sunglasses. Ajahn Tong wears sunglasses. Why? Because he had eye surgery and the light is, uh, or has been, or was, uh, very, very, uh, his eyes were very sensitive to sunlight. And, you know, I know lots of monks in Thailand who wear, uh, sungla uh, wear sunglasses. I don't really think it's that great of an idea, but... It's not in and of itself a, a cor you know a sign of huge corruption. I mean, there are far worse things that can and probably do go on that we're not really aware of. But um, you'd be careful not to judge, not not, not to judge things by ex appearances or etc. I think it turns out that those monks were selling drugs or doing drugs or this or that, or had women or this or that. So yeah, that's something you can definitely criticize them about. But um, it's an interesting quote. I mean, it's a, it's on the face. It's a sign of of the importance of not clinging to to our place, our possessions, not clinging to be mindful. But uh, deeper down, and if you know the backstory, it has more to do with the idea that you don't need to be too concerned about going off into the forest. Oh, how can I follow the Buddha's teaching, living in the home life. Yeah, it's more difficult. Yeah, you're going to be tested and tried, but it can be done. And we should we should be clear about two things. One, that it can be done. And two, that unless we're really, really mindful, it's much easier to get attached. So you have to be more on your guard, more vigilant when you're living in lay society, when you're living in a house. You know. Much easier to be mindful. It's actually kind of cheating. It's easier. It's a, a, an easier way to go off in the forest, where we think, oh, going off in the forest, that's difficult. It's not really difficult. Living in the forest, there's nothing. It's just simple and easy, and it's, it's wonderful. Anyway, so that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in, wishing you all good practice, and that you all become free from suffering.